Okay, now Ellen mentioned high energy physics and I think uh, our next speaker, Matt Ballis, uh, is our, our first high energy physics representative at this meeting. Matt, are you there? Yes. Uh, I am. Do you want to share your... Oh. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Sounds great, yes. Okay, great. Let me, uh, I will try uh, sharing my screen and you can let me know if it is um, being shared. Yes. Uh, great. It's coming through. Yep, looks good. Yes, coming through. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so I'm not able to see anybody uh, visually at this point. So if for some reason um, there's an issue with my volume or with uh, the slides, please uh, someone just start shouting uh, and I should be able to hear it. Um, so thanks very much for the introduction and I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to present this work to, to, this, uh, to this community that I've never uh, spoken to, but this is the experts and so I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to uh, uh, these talks have been fantastic and uh, really inspiring. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a project of mine I've been working on for a few years now that has now turned into uh, something I refer to as HEP file. And this is really wrapping HDF5 to give a root-like functionality for HEP data sets. I'll explain what all this means in a moment. Uh, but very quickly, HEP refers to high energy uh, physics. Um, so I'm at Siena College. Not everybody's uh, aware of that, so I'll tell you where it is. Um, if you are looking at the slides uh, that are posted on the agenda, I have some relevant links if anybody uh, wants to check any of this out, including a notebook example, um, if, uh, if you get bored or want to uh, play around with this. So I'm at Siena College. We're actually an undergraduate only institution in upstate New York in the United States. Uh, so we have no graduate students. We have about 3,000 students. Uh, at Siena College. We're located about a two and a half hour train ride north of New York City. And I've been a member of the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider since 2013. Uh, we have an NSF grant to contribute uh, through the research of primarily undergraduate institutions. And prior to working on CMS, I, was a, I still am a member of the Babar collaboration, uh, which was a E plus E minus experiment out at uh, Slack. And before that, I worked at, uh, on uh, photonuclear reactions at Jefferson Lab in Virginia. So I have a variety of um, experiences in the medium and high energy uh, field. And before I go any further, I want to give a shout out very quickly to the students that have worked on me. Sometimes this gets saved till the end, uh, but their contributions have been so significant. I want to recognize uh, Willow, Ryan, and Gabby, who are all Siena students and have worked on this over the years. And then last year, I worked with a Cornell uh, student uh, who was funded by a Diana Hep Fellowship. This is an effort to uh, produce a more robust software in the high energy physics community. And Matt really pushed along this, this project. So uh, I've talked for a while. I haven't told you anything about the project. Oh, sorry, did, was there a comment? No, okay. I thought I heard something, sorry. So let me tell you the problem that we're trying to solve. This may be um, common knowledge to everybody, but I'll just go through it. Um, high energy physics data is heterogeneous and complicated. And when I say heterogeneous, I say that um, the data doesn't lend itself to an N by M grid. Uh, for example, uh, you might have this particle physics experiment where your sensors find different uh, muons, electrons, and then these other objects called jets, which are sprays of particles. And so in each collision, you might have different numbers of these particles. You might have two muons and three jets in one collision, 12 electrons and five muons and no jets in another. And then each particle, you're st uh, storing specific data attached to it, so momentum, charge, but you may not have the same information attached to each one. So your jets might have very different information. And this is not even uh, thinking about the actual detector information. These are are reconstructed objects. And if you're not familiar with um, high energy physics data and you want to kind of like tune that out, that's totally fine. Um, when I worked with Matt last year, we developed an example where you're thinking of a census of a town. So instead of a proton-proton collision, you might think about a household and you need to uh, store information about that household, about the people, maybe the vehicles, the place of residence. 
So every person has name, gender, age, maybe some other information attached to it. Each car might have an age and a license plate. Um, each household, you're wanting to store the number of bedrooms and bathrooms. And so your data looks kind of um, heterogeneous. This is just one household here. And a different household might have you know, no bikes and one car and 12 people or something like that. So how do you work with data like this? And in the high energy physics community, the current solution is root, um, which we all use. And um, we all have probably a love hate relationship with it. It is an amazing, amazing tool that has really supported the community for a few decades now. Uh, one challenge is that it's monolithic, meaning that if you wanna open a root file, you have to install the entire uh, package uh, and all the plotting information and a bunch of other objects that you may not need just to access uh, the file. Now, uh, there's been some, uh, some nice development. When I started working with Root, I was writing everything in just pure C++. Uh, there are some wrappers to it, something called PyRoot, which helps for those of us who work um, more with Python now, but you're still tied to a file format that is really bound up in the analysis system. And what we found over the last you know, 10 or 15 years is we've tried to interface more with non-HEP people, so the broader computing community, is that this is sometimes a challenge just you know, giving them a root file. Now, over the last five years, I want to acknowledge that kind of parallel to my effort, there's been you know, people who are a lot better than I uh, working on a few other projects, one of which is called Uproot. And Uproot is a Python uh, library that allows you to interface with root files without installing the whole package. So you can pip install Uproot and start attacking root files. Um, and this was done by Jim Pivarsky and a number of other people. It's a really nice package. I use it at times as well. It's interesting, he and I both started these packages around the same time. He worked on a package to open root files and I decided to try to see how far I could push a file format that does not use root. So what else was motivating me? Um, so in about 2000, since 2013, um, I created and maintained a website called Particle Physics Playground. Um, and this was designed to provide uh, simplified particle physics data for outreach and education. And when I first started this, I just had zipped text files uh, where I knew the file format. Um, it had data from the CMS experiment, but also Babar and Clio, which was an experiment that ran at Cornell. They all had slightly different data. And so what I would do is I would write these custom Python accessors. So just little Python uh, tools that knew about the knowledge of these text structures. Um, but as I added different experiments, it was getting complicated to maintain. So um, I kind of went back to the idea of coming up with a, a different file format. And at a workshop in Annecy, France, I was kind of inspired to really throw myself into it. And so in 2017, I had the beginnings of something called H5HEP. Now, I'll explain the H5 in just a second, but when I started writing it, I really thought about it from the UI, uh, UX, uh, and the API standpoint first. So that is, I sat down and I said, what do I want to type? What would I, as a user, want to write in order to like, you know, really physically type in order to get access to uh, some of these uh, the data, as well as create the data, and then I would figure out how to implement it. Um, you know, again, like I said, we have kind of a love-hate relationship with Root. Um, sometimes it's not in the way we would think it would be written. And again, that is not a criticism of Root itself. Again, Root has really maintained the community for like three decades. So it's an amazing project. Now, I didn't want to write an entire file structure from uh, scratch. And I was aware of HDF5 uh, from when I had been at Stanford and uh, people I knew who were working on the synchrotron, uh, the light source were using it. And I was like, oh, this is great. It's robust. It's been around for a long time. Someone else much smarter than I had done the heavy lifting of actually implementing it. Um, and then there was this H5Pi tool uh, that we all know about. Um, I was like, oh, I can just start interfacing with these. And the fact that the data sets are stored in these groups, and um, I don't know why I've got that repeated, uh, it's very HEP-like the way it's laid out. Now, back in 2014, I actually tried, uh, even before Particle Physics Playground was really up and running, uh, I tried actually doing stuff with HDF5, and I could just not figure out a way to use it efficiently, because uh, I kept thinking about you know, this n by m structure that HDF5 likes, and I couldn't figure out how to uh, merge the two approaches. 
Um, so by 2018, um, H5 HEP, I did have a, a simplified uh, a working tool where I was able to store this data in HDF5. Uh, and then in 2021, I proposed a fellowship project through this Diana HEP project. I worked with Matt Dreyer. Um, and last summer, we actually did a tremendous amount of work. And we renamed the project to be HEP file. This is heterogeneous entries in parallel file. Um, we wanted it to be pip installed. Uh, we wanted to have a real documentation with read the docs. Um, we had kind of the basics, but we wanted this uh, again, much more robust and maintainable. And so we added a whole bunch of functionality where we can store strings, we can add attributes now, so we can really make use of the metadata that HDF5 allows us to have and embed documentation uh, in the file format. We wanted to improve the documentation. There's this great approach uh, by Henry Schreiner and others to uh, develop a cookie cutter. Um, basically, it's a template if you want to create a Python package and how to distribute it. Uh, we wanted to make the code much more robust and fault tolerant. We did that. We added a whole bunch of necessary unit tests. Um, we wanted to, we set up a whole um, uh, CI interface, uh, CI uh, workflow. And then we wanted to submit it to JOS. Uh, this is still in the works. So we have something now. We've got HEP file. Uh, I really like it. Uh, we converted H5 HEP. And what we did is we actually, uh, instead of just implementing it, we really focused on defining uh, a schema, at least the way I understand this term. And I apologize if I'm not using it exactly. Uh, but we really wanted to think about how to organize the data and how uh, everything is stored and what metadata needs to be stored. And when I show you how the data is laid out, um, you'll see what I mean. So, you know, the regular HDF5 file format lends itself kind of to thinking about how we do things. So I might have a group called Jets, and then I might have a data set that stores their energy, a bunch of other values. The muon group might have, again, energy, but also charge, transverse momentum. And so the question is still how to use this kind of basic ideas, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, in a, uh, in a general way. We wanted to define a minimal useful API and then implement it with Python and HDF5. And what I mean by this is we focused on the idea of defining how the data could be laid out such that if you didn't want to use Python, uh, you could still implement HEP file. And if you didn't want to use HDF5, if you wanted to use Parquet or um, even a text file, so long as it had a very particular structure, uh, you could still interface with it. Um, and the idea was to have something that might be um, you know, forward compatible. Now, beyond HDF5, uh, we also, uh, this whole approach defines the structure for two Python dictionaries that helps with packing and unpacking of data. So it's not just the idea of how you store everything in HDF5, it's how you extract it in a way which is useful for the users. So this started as an outreach uh, project. And so I wanted something that really used native Python tools that had as minimal overhead as possible. And if anybody uh, in the audience has ever used root, this is the idea of using like the tea tree object um, to, uh, to interface and work with the data. Um, so we read everything out from our file and then unpack it into two dictionaries. So, so let me explain how we, we pack everything in HEP file. This is really the only um, couple slides, few slides that I have uh, with uh, the real layout. So imagine I have a given event and this event has three of these types of objects. Let's call these jets. So I have three jets where I have some information about the energy, the three momentum, and then let's say some other tagging variable. And then I might have two muons where again, I have energy, three momentum, charge, and some other tag that explains how they were, how they were measured. And I wanna take this and I wanna pack this into HEP file, uh, which is really again, HDF5. And so I'll have this group called jets, and then I will have these data sets of energy, X, Y, Z, momentum, and then a tag. And you see for the first event, you're kind of just like sliding it in uh, to these data sets here. But notice there's this value here, NJ, which is a counter, which is keeping track of how many jets I have and how many muons. So the first, uh, the first values just get slotted in, the first um, entries. But now I go to my next event and I've got to figure out how to get this in. And I used to like try to create like a whole new group uh, for each one of these. Each event was its own group. 
Uh, but what we do again is we just take this information and we slot it in basically stacking it uh, within a given group. So again, the jets is the data set energy, or sorry, jets is the group. This energy is the data set. I just stack everything in one big column, but I've got this counter here that says, hey, look, the first three entries belong to one uh, collision, one proton-proton collision. The next two entries belong to another proton-proton collision. And now I've got this information that I can write some code to figure out how to unpack everything. Um, again, I started kind of writing the interface with it. Uh, I wanted to stick with the HDF5 terminology. Uh, so I still create a group, uh, give it some name, and then I can define that counter. I create my data sets where I can pass in even a list of data sets uh, and assign it to my group. So for me, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing for everybody, but for me, this is actually very uh, useful to, to think about it. Um, when I'm actually looping over my data, uh, it creates these dictionaries that I work with. I fill the values uh, and then I pack everything into a different dictionary. And then at the end, I take my dictionary and I write it to file. Uh, again, it knows how to work with the structure of everything. And so it's just a one-liner. So uh, I'll wrap this up. Uh, the Read the Docs is getting populated. Um, we've been working on it. You know, Last summer, we did a whole bunch. Uh, I have a fairly heavy teaching load. We're an undergraduate-only institution. Um, and so during the school year, it, it's been hard to get work done. It's kind of been incremental. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to give this talk here because it motivated me to uh, kind of revisit some of this. I found a couple of bugs on, uh, on the GitHub page uh, last week. So that was, uh, that was good to kind of squash those. Um, so this is all coming together. If someone wanted to, you could clone it from GitHub yourself. Uh, we use Flit for the installation um, or you could just pip install uh, we're working on actually developing uh, some interfaces with some other tools like the awkward array system, uh, where you could just pull out your data into awkward arrays, which many people in the HEP community are starting to use. Um, and so this is in development. Um, the other reason why I like using HDF5 is that um, you know, I could use different languages. So there are you know, a number of people that are exploring Julia. So this last winter, one of my students, Gabby, uh, we just did some very simple test cases where we pack everything into this H, uh, H5 format, HDF5, uh, and we pull out you know, things like the jet energy and histogram it. This does not build any of the real uh, dictionaries that we use, but the fact that it, you know, it's a standard HDF5 format. Um, in Julia, someone, God bless, wrote a HDF5 library and so I could play around with this in Julia if I wanted to. Uh, I don't really know Julia, uh, but this was a nice, um, uh, this was just a nice fun project with a student just to show that this is possible. Because now I could take my, my high energy physics data and give it to a Julia expert. Uh, and if I explain you know, the data layout or I've got enough metadata in there that explains it, uh, they could go and, and work with it in Julia if they, if they didn't like Python or, or whatever comes after that. You, know, you could write something in obviously C or C++ if you wanted as well. Uh, so let me just summarize. Um, so I've been using HEP file in the particle physics playground. I think it's still the old H5 HEP format, but it's effectively the same thing. It'll get translated over sometime in the next six months. Uh, for me personally, I'm actually using HEP file regularly in my CMS analysis. So I run over a bunch of root files and then I write these um, HEP files because I like working with them better. Um, every time I show this to people, there's quite a bit of interest. Uh, there's obviously a huge amount of uh, inertia within the community with roots and stuff, but a number of other people are using HDF5 for other uh, parts of uh, either the analysis or the monitoring system. Um, so maybe not the final analysis that everybody uses, uh, but again, every time I show it to people, uh, people are, are actually quite intrigued. Um, so on my to-do list probably over the next six months is to add a few more features. I have to refactor the internal storage a little bit um, more before I kind of release a version 1.0 and finish the documentation. We do want to submit this to, to JOS to make it a little bit more formalized. Um, and I'll stop there for, for any questions that people might have. Um, and I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to present this to this community. So thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Um, are there any questions? Uh, any questions online? Yeah, I have one. 
Hi Matt, ahead. thanks for the, that was a good talk. Um, I'm just wondering, is there, are there any remaining limitations as compared to Root at the moment? And are they things that you, you see a way around or are they things that you've, you're, you're accepting that this is a better way to do it and you just put up with them? Right, right. So, so I'm really approaching this from the point of view of a um, single user, right? Uh, where I can run over the data myself. I'm not required to store, you know, 10 petabytes of data and have it like mirrored all over the world. So, so let me just kind of point out that, you know, I am kind of focused on a very particular use case. When I've done um, single speed tests, uh, the HDF5 performs better in partly because I actually pull out all of the data all at once, read it into memory because I know what the size of it is, and then I start working with it. And the root has a lot of really nice features built in with streaming the data. Um, and so that might be a little slower at first, but it's also sometimes more robust if you have like a giant file and you're worried about like chewing up all your memory. With the HEP file, you can choose to pull out, let's say a hundred entries, you know, a hundred events at a time, um, but it's up to the user to actually build in that streaming capability. So I would say that a lot of people who work and develop root really want to hide a lot of that, um, you know, kind of like fault tolerance and that ability to kind of stream by default. And I am much more like, I want to expose everything. If the user does something dumb, that's on them. Dumb is not the right word. If the user is not aware of some of the, like, let's say memory limitations, then, then they'll crash. So, it's a little bit of a philosophy that, um, you know, with HEP file, it's not really trying to catch you if you do something that might not be best for your system. Um, you know, I have not yet tested a lot of like the parallelism, the idea of like reading from like multiple uh, streams at once, uh, just because I haven't had the time to do that. You know, again, like I, I pointed out, other people smarter than I have built in all of these great features to HDF5. Uh, um, and so my hope is that, you know, I'm just, all I've done is find a way to pack the data into HDF5. Um, and so my hope is that naively, you know, all of these kind of other features would work out of the box. So that's a long way of saying for my own use case, I don't think, you know, I have had no problems, um, but I have not done a real hammer test to see how this scales to like, you know, tens of terabytes of data where you might have like, you know, hundred different processors attacking the same file. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? No? Okay, then thanks again, Matt. Thank uh, you. Nice talk. And we will, we will take a five minute break here uh, just for people to get a chance to go to the bathroom, uh, get a zip of water, and then we'll continue.